Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Circle of Stories Season 3. Today we have a very exciting episode. Uh, I'm not sure if that conversation will be that exciting, but I'm sure uh, we'll be talking about a lot of actual issues and their practical solutions. We are very honored that we are today Ahmed Rafi Alam. First of all, sir, thank you for your time and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute privilege. Thank you, sir. I'm going to read your profile because you wear a lot of hats and I'm going not, I don't want to make a mistake, right. but he's an environmental lawyer, he's an activist, he teaches, he writes. Uh, but we are going to talk about primarily, and he is the co-founder of uh, Salim Alam & Co. That's a firm that specializes in energy, water, natural resources, and urban development. And this is what our conversation will be about. We will talk about what issues are in our society as a climate change, and what issues are in our society. And because of your public and private sector experience hai in uh, Lesco and the Lahore Waste Management Company, ke hai, that is something I really want to talk about. Interesting experiences, I'm sure. But... Uh, Iska hame fayda ye hai ke he'll be able to tell us about ke private sector mein kya kaam ho raha hai, public sector mein kya ho raha hai, aur hame isko kaise aage leke chal sakte hain. So sir, before I jump into the serious conversation, ham log thode bigde huye hain suits or Boston legal type shows dekh ke, aur when we think of a lawyer, we think of a fancy life and uh, big cars. You have a beautiful car by the way, right. but uh, how did you end up and why did you choose this specific field? Well, thank you. Uh, I chose this field of law because, well, I chose law because I thought at some level I'd be able to help people. Um, I did an internship with Madam Asma Jangir a very long time ago, uh, in the early 1990s. And I felt that this is this is an, uh, something I could do. And it wasn't until much later after I'd practiced for many years as a corporate lawyer, as I said, I tell people, I told people that I used to make rich people richer. Then I came across the subject of environment law and it, it struck a lot of chords with me because uh, my interest in environmental law just didn't stem from an interest in the ecosystems or, or nature. It actually stemmed from a deep interest and hobby in the history of Lahore. And Lahore, I felt a certain amount of, I felt protective towards it. And there have been attempts to take away some of its trees or take away some of its green areas and I felt that I found that the environment law was very helpful in, in stopping or rearranging those attempts and making them a little bit more sustainable. Then I knew that in Pakistan, I knew that there was a lot of banking in the banking. But the mahaliyati is a little low. So I thought that we don't have a little specialization here. And if there's no one, then the competition is a little low. And that's how I became an enviro lawyer. It also ticked off a lot of other things that I, I, I felt I could do. And I became an enviro lawyer. And it, it, it's certainly not a Harvey Specter lifestyle. I do have a wonderful car. Actually, it's not mine. The car that you saw outside, and I just want to point out to everyone, it's, a, it's not a flashy car. It's a very old car. It's a 1948 MG Model T that my father got in 1973 for 400 rupees. It was the only car we had in the family. I used to go to school in this car. My sister and I would sit in the back seat in, in Cumbles and we'd be driven to school. So no, environment law is not a sort of very lucrative side of the profession where you can afford high-powered automobiles and things like that. And also as an environment lawyer, I'm not into cars. I think that's motorhead nonsense, frankly. Let's some divert a little bit. I have a follow-up question. Uh, since you have, you know, many years of experience now, so how do you see your journey so far as a personal journey, a professional personal? You made a choice yes. and you have, you know, lived by yes. it. I did. And it was uh, uh, another lawyer called Mahmood Manviwala. I was a senior in Karachi in the early 2000s. And he gave me two bits of advice as a young lawyer. He said, sit there. Sit there. You've got to sit there. And I sit there and my hair is gone. And it has its advantages. And the he said, specialize and Manviwala Saab had specialized in privatization in the early 90s. The late 90s major privatization hui thi, he conquered that field and made lots of money, lots of it. So I thought, you know, when I discovered that environment law could answer some of my concerns about protecting the heritage and green of Lahore, I figured I could specialize in this field uh, and, and moved into it. And that's how I find myself here. And it, the, the thing that, it, that, that that's Manviwala Saab's advice, followed by another mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Nadeem Al-Haq, who encouraged me at some level to write. 
in us work in the early 2000s we didn't have that even the television media that we have today or certainly not the internet youtube the baad mein aaya tha it came in 2009 so the only way of communicating at a, at a large scale was to, at that time write in newspapers so i wrote a column on environment and urban issues in a newspaper for nearly 5 years every week and us do fai the way ek to i learned the subject myself because if in order to write a 1200 word article you have to read a considerable amount so i consider it my second or third university education was writing those five years of columns and um, you know I, thanks to allah it it gave me a certain amount of recognition in the field as well and it was by writing the articles and writing about the things i did about how cities should be more sustainable how energy could be more in, in efficiently used how waste management could be more streamlined that i was offered remarkable opportunities in the public sector to be part of decision making especially in these public utilities like the lahore electric supply company or the lahore waste management company so i consider that my my experience in what i called applied activism because is mulk mein cheeze rokna aasan hai kaam karna bada mushkil so this was applied activism eh? try and get a grid station made or a landfill made that's challenging stuff and so i had a fantastic experience on the board of these entities and some others as well uh, being able to work with a large group of people shaping their decisions forming policy and then making sure things get done sir yahi se pick up karte hain you mentioned ki there are laws uh, and jinko apne padha jinko study kiya and you came into this field ke iske through hum lahore ko bacha sakte hain society ko at large bacha sakte hain so what are the main main legislation which protects a city like lahore what is in terms of environment in terms of well we've got the environment protection act that's supposed to keep industry in check so that they don't use things like uh, black carbon and rubber as a form of energy and pollute the air we have the parks and horticulture act which protects green belts we have something called the lahore canal heritage park act that i have the great privilege of of being part of i wrote it as a matter of fact the entire canal from uh, toker till about jello park uh, from the whole right of way the green, bit in the middle and the green belts on the side are a heritage park declared by law of the punjab assembly it's the only park of its kind in pakistan the only law of its kind in pakistan as well and you can't touch anything on that green belt without uh, you know certain permissions from the parks and horticulture authority and i i i say this somewhat pain because we live very close to the canal and also very close to zaman park where a considerable amount of destruction to the green belt is currently taking place our laws aren't designed to protect cities in fact even if they were it's not really the law but how the law is used the law is used by property developers to spread the city outwards and to benefit a very small minority urban elite can, that can afford 2 crore plots and 4 crore homes and that seems to be the design of the city much to the detriment to, of its environment you have worked in legislation apne ek law likha and you have been part of many other processes as well and then you see this actual implementation which at times can be very demotivating or discouraging that you know you put in a lot of effort you have logical rational scientific argument ki ye nahi karna chahiye isse ye hoga but then again you know some of them just bulldoze no but life is not that black and white and perfection is for the gods and i know this from from my own experience and from what others have taught me that activism isn't about winning it's about getting up every single day and fighting because you never really solve a problem in public policy you just push an agenda forward and you have to be part of pushing every single day there's never really a victory things can go bad very quickly if you're not always fighting and that that's the job of an activist is always be out there making sure that people know what the right direction is and what right and wrong is recently last year unfortunately we saw a lot of floods obviously hame nazar aaya ki uski wajah se problem aayi uske sath fir hame nazar aata hai ki hame food cycles se nazar aa raha hai ki wahan pe aage issues aa sakte hain aaj subah hi balki dawn mein news thi ki barish ki wajah se shayad pakistan india mein crops affect honge ye aur ye ek aise discussion hai ki main khud apna dilao to hum 5 10 saal ke jaise sunte aa rahe hain when we were in university college to hame aise se pata chalna shuru hua aur har saal articles news conferences governments आई और लास्ट ईयर जो आप हम बात भी कर रहे थे कि शेरी रहमान ने बहुत काम किया है उस हवाले से सो so जनरली हमारी जो लोकल पॉलिसी इस टाइम पाकिस्तान की है क्या अगर मैं कहता हूँ क्लाइमेट चेंज के हवाले से जी क्लाइमेट चेंज के हवाले से यू हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट क्लाइमेट चेंज इज फर्स्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड पाकिस्तान कंटेक्चुअल रिस्पॉन्स एंड क्रिटिक इट क्लाइमेट चेंज इज caused by greenhouse gases ग्रीन हाउस गैसेज आर प्रोड्यूस्ड वेन एवर वी टेक समथिंग आउट ऑफ द अर्थ इन बर्न इट 
فور آ انرجی اور ٹرانسپورٹ نیڈس چاہے وہ درخت ہو کوئلہ ہو گیس ہو پٹرول ہو ڈیزل ہو جو بھی ہے زمین سے نکال کے اس کو جلائیں گے ایٹ سم لیول گرین ہاؤس گیس پیدا ہوگی اینڈ گرین ہاؤس گیس از ٹریپ دی ارتھ ٹریپ دا ہیٹ آف دا سن ان دی ارتھ ایٹموسفیئر اینڈ کاز گلوبل وارمنگ دس گلوبل وارمنگ از از کوائٹ ورینگ بیکاز دی ارتھ ایور سنس دا لاسٹ آئی سیج سیون ہنڈریڈ تھاؤزینڈ ایئرز اگو ہیز ہیڈ اے اسٹیبل ایکو سسٹم اینڈ انوائرمنٹ اسٹیبل انف فار people like us humans to have large scale agriculture to support our civilization that we have today it's it's this balance of the right temperatures the right amount of air the right amount of water all exists in balance so that we can thrive as a species and this increasing temperature this global warming is threatening that delicate balance and threatening to to tip it so that it can't recover or rather when it tips we will not be able to have that agriculture that currently supports our civilization so what climate change is doing is it's threatening our civilization when we won't go extinct as human beings but the fact that we can sit and relax in an atmosphere like this in a beautiful garden like this will all be threatened is all threatened because compared to the industrial revolution when the large scale use of fossil fuels drove our economies Um, temperatures have, have risen just about, on average, about one degree centigrade in the last 250 years. And that one degree centigrade of warming has seen oceans heat up and acidify, coral reefs bleach and die. We've seen forest fires in Australia in 2019-20, when 800 million animals died there in the course of three months. There have been forest fires in the Arctic Circle, unheard of in human history, unheard of, because now it's warm enough for things to catch fire over there. And human beings have plastic in their bodies. There is so much greenhouse gas in the atmosphere today, Aj, in 2023, that scientists tell us that we're probably locked into a 1.5 degree centigrade temperature increase by 2030, which is seven years from now, and possibly two degrees by 2050, 2060. There is no agriculture present that can withstand a two degree temperature increase. And we've locked these temperatures in unless we do dramatic things to our economy and society to reduce our dependence on greenhouse gases and fossil fuels. So the first and important thing for the entire world to do is reduce greenhouse gases. Now, greenhouse gases aren't produced equally. And you know, you've heard that Pakistan's contribution to greenhouse gases is negligible. Pakistan's only 75 years old, right? What about things like Northern Europe or the United States, which are working for 250-300 years, and they have the lion's share. Uh, historically and today uh, countries like Brazil and China consume a huge amount of fossil fuel uh, to drive their own economies and they certainly share a, a considerable amount of blame today. So that's one aspect of climate change is holding those countries and economies to account so that they reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Countries like Pakistan are threatened by climate change. We're at risk. And it's not because we have a uniquely vulnerable ecosystem. There are floods and devastation due to the environment, due to climate change all over the world. I mean, Philippines saw three or four cyclones. There was flooding in Kenya, there was flooding in Germany, and flooding in Spain last year, not just in Pakistan. And we see this all over the place. No place on earth is safe from the impacts of climate change. Pakistan is vulnerable mostly because we're poor and we have bad governance. And that's where we come to our local context. Uh, we had these floods last year, not floods where the rivers broke their bank like they did in 2010, but these were floods caused by rainfall. And there's something called an attribution science study that was done by Imperial College London last year that found or rather concluded that about 75% of the intensity of last year's monsoon rains that fell on Balochistan and Sindh, which were between, I think, 500 to 800 percent monthly rainfall. I mean, unprecedented rain. But 75 percent of the intensity of that rainfall was caused by the one degree centigrade temperature increase of global warming, which is historically the responsibility of the global north. Pakistan was not responsible for this flooding. And it also rained in areas of Pakistan where it doesn't normally rain. You know, 30 million Pakistanis were displaced last year. There's still about 10 million Pakistanis out of their home today because the water that fell has nowhere naturally to drain out. It fell in areas where it doesn't normally rain or where there's no water. It's not going anywhere. The scale of that is so immense. Sitting in an urban area, we can't seem to relate to how devastating that is. And so that then starts the question, what should Pakistan's response be? Pakistan's response certainly should be at one level to argue and lobby Uh, the global north to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, but at the same time, make preparations at home here to prepare for the worst that's going to happen. 
if you think that last year's floods were catastrophic, do remember that just before the floods, Pakistan had no water because we were facing a heat wave, an unprecedented heat wave. And I'll say this again, last year and this year are the coolest summers of the rest of our lives. It's only going to get hotter from here. And the hotter it gets, the more intense the monsoon rainfall. So we're probably going to see another, another rainfall like that. We've got to prepare for this. And in the face of these imminent climate threats, what are we doing? What's the current discourse since last year with 30 million Pakistanis out of the house? So, uh, let me tell you. Tosha Khana se ghadi nikli. Ji, chief of army staff ki wo extension, transfer posting. Khatmin nabuvat. Our politics are stuck here. And it's, it's very frustrating because there are so many people at risk and our, our national and local politics don't seem to get the idea where they need to be focusing. And if it isn't the threats of rain or the threats of uh, uh, drought, it's the air pollution that we suffer throughout the year as well. Like in Lahore, we have five years or six years of our life expectancy taken away because of the unlivable air pollution. And most air pollution is greenhouse gases. You know, diesel, petrol, or coal se kuch jala hoga to produce this pollution. So our politics are not focusing at the, on this at all. That said, we do have something called a national climate policy. Pakistan is one of the few countries that has one. And we also have a Climate Act of 2017. Again, Pakistan is one of the few countries that has a Climate Act. But there are challenges. It's, it's not good enough just to have a policy. You've got to have political interest driving that policy and making sure it, it comes alive. Like I said, activism is always about, about making sure things are, are working in the right direction. Um, and it's, it's the lack of focus, the lack of attention to the subject, which means that these areas, these policy areas, these legislative areas are not being followed up on. This is not. Sir, a question in this mind is that we talk about all the issues and you have response to our response. So, power of corridors, we say, we are not interested, there is a lack of awareness. I mean, we don't know about this thing, or they just don't care, they have other priorities. Like, they have other priorities. I remember, for example, uh, I think it was late 2017, early 2018, might have been early 2018, I was part of uh, a team uh, with a group called Air Quality Asia I work with. And we had gone to Islamabad to speak to, at that time, it was the National Assembly and the Senate's, both their standing committees on climate change. So we had about 35 MNAs and senators in the room and talking to them about air pollution. We're talking about 2017-18. And everyone in the room was interested. Because air pollution is something unlike a lot of other issues, it really is a Pakistan-wide issue. And everyone can see it and feel it and their kids are involved. So everyone has a sense about it. And Air Quality Asia, was, we were talking about what we can do. And almost everyone I spoke to, no, I think everyone I spoke to that day, said, uh, those are the ki baat, election ki baat. Theek hai? Uh, and at that time, they didn't realize that government changed. The new government came in. They were fighting or learning their ropes. And before they could figure things out, vote of no confidence. Now we have another government which is worried about whether or not there's an election in later this year. The lack, the constant disruption in our democratic politics means that we are not focusing on the real issues. Folks who have no business in politics should keep the hell out of politics so politicians can do their jobs because they are concerned. But if you keep on throwing them in jail without any proof, you know, look at the, the absolute circus of the last five years. So that brings my question. Then we talk about the private sector. Ki baat karte hai. Uh, we have discussed what's happening in the public sector, why it's happening, why it's happening. Private sector, mein, there is an ages old debate. Age old debate is that in the corporate sector, pehle you pollute something and then you do CSR activities or you are sponsoring that conference's particular conference. Ke apne wo kiya. Yes, so, as far as I'm concerned, CSR in Pakistan is an opportunity for companies to hire freshly graduated children of senior diplomats and army officers and give them a nice salary so that your company doesn't get into trouble and they can do something nice like run a school or maybe recycle some paper. The history of environmental law and its growth around the world has not been through the corporate sector and its CSR efforts. It has been very much civil society turning around and telling businesses, no, stop it. We heard of something called the Basel Convention. It's the international agreement that regulates the transportation of hazardous substances around the world. So chemicals and things like that, if you want to import, export them, you have to follow something called the Basel uh, Convention. The Basel is a river in Switzerland, which uh, I think it was Bayer 
ایز اے بگ فارما کمپنی اٹس اے سوئس فارما کمپنی انہوں نے اس نہر کو اتنا آلودہ کر دیا تھا کہ وہاں کے لوگوں نے شور ڈالا اٹس ناؤ کال دا بیزل کنونشن یو نو اگین اے لاٹ آف ایئر پولوشن ایشوز ان کینیڈا اینڈ ان دا یونائٹیڈ اسٹیٹس بیکاز نیو یارک سٹی یوز ٹو سفر فرام کرپلنگ ایئر پولوشن سول سوسائٹی نے آ کے شور نکالا شور سو مچ سو دیٹ یو نو ان لنڈن ایئر پولوشن سول سوسائٹی کے مار ایوری وے یو گو اٹ از اے پولیٹیکل رسپانس از اے سوشل اینڈ پولیٹیکل رسپانس دیٹ میڈ اے ڈفرینس ناٹ ناٹ کمپنیز اینڈ کارپوریشن بیکاز کمپنیز اینڈ کارپوریشن آر یو نو دے ٹرائنگ ٹو سروائو اینڈ دے ٹرائنگ ٹو میک منی they have no interest in protecting this environment as a matter of fact the current model of economics that we have in the world this neoliberal economics allows for a unaccountable exploitation of natural resources and human labor for the for the collection and concentration of private wealth and the creation of poverty right right i was coming to that but they should be held accountable for doing accountability this. and see the lack of accountability is also perhaps why people say aisa hi hota not everyone pollutes right and as a matter of fact to suggest that a large population is the the cause of pollution is incorrect relatively few people pollute and it's actually on a scale of affluence the richer you are the more you pollute you know jeff bezos going to space consumed so much fuel more fuel than a man in bakar would consume in his entire life so you can't blame just population it's it's affluent behavior that causes this and it's the rich that disproportionately pollute the earth and they are not brought to account because they use their disproportionate influence to get out of trouble and that means oh everyone's like aisa hi hota but aisa nahi hota by and large log sharif hain they don't want to pollute the world sir per question per yahan pe aate hain sir aapne example di civil right to store up hamare yahan bhi hum wohi assumption lagate hain by and large log sharif hain aur unko hum mutasir ho rahe hain cheezon se hamare bacche hum log smog se ab khud ho rahe hain i never had a allergy smog ke pollution ke air pollution se for the last 4 years i constantly cuff during all these 4 5 months to phir hamari society abhi tak khadi kyun nahi hui khadi hoti hai uh, air pollution chale urban areas mein mushkil hai what about last year in gwadar there were over 100000 people came out and said yahan pani theek nahi hai aur aap pani chiniyon ko pot de rahe hain yahan pani ka plant aapne lagaya nahi hai aur mahine ke liye nikle the unki awaaz badi mushkil yahan tak pahunchi thi because people interfere in our democratic politics because powers interfere in our di- diplomatic uh, dip- uh, yeah, democratic politics you don't interfere that voice would be so loud yeah the thing with air pollution are everyone i speak to on air pollution is concerned about it right if you put it on a ballot people would vote on it uh but we're too busy on our day to days and then good lord yaar yahan tear gas ho jayega khan sahab ko bail milegi chief of army staff kaun hai is these things distract us when in reality we should be focusing on on the important things on our on our health on our lives on our children's lives on our ed, on their education and their future none of these issues that i just spoke about relate to our health or our children's futures is sub scenario mr how do you see what progress we have made so far uh, as a society as a country alienation ki humne baat ki hai lekin awareness se hum start karte hain bare minimum chale hain awareness aa gayi hai log aware ho rahe hain but if you look back at last 20 years uh, what positives do you see دیکھیں آئی مینشن دا لاہور کنال ہیریٹیج پارک ایکٹ ٹھیک ہے جی دیٹس اے سکسیس دیر پلینٹی آف سکسیس آئی آئی ہیو دا گریٹ پرویز آف ورکنگ وتھ سمن کال ڈاکٹر پرویز حسن ہی ایز پٹ تھنگس ٹو ان ٹو پلیس دیٹ آر انبلیویبل ہی واز آس ٹو لیڈ اے کمیشن فارم بائی دا لاہور ہائی کورٹ ٹو لک ان ٹو کین بی ڈن اباؤٹ کلائمیٹ چینج ان ٹو تھاؤزنڈ سکسٹین جسٹس منصور فارم دا کلائمیٹ چینج کمیشن اینڈ at the end of the outcome of that commission was something close to 500 projects climate change projects adopted by the government of punjab in just one year for example you know for example we did some activism on the kanalik pura kanoon humne nikala things happen and i'm karachi mein pani ke hawale se shahab gusto who's a usto is a lawyer he filed a petition in 2015 16 about the water situation in karachi it was taken up by the supreme court they formed a commission aur ab karachi mein wo tanker mafia jo thodi bahut kam ho gayi there are examples you'll find everywhere of people from civil society leveraging whatever powers they have and getting results done i'm feeling that you will say there is hope there is hope i, I should also mention my absolute hero raja wasim saab from chakwal جب دو ہزار چار پانچ میں چکوال میں سیمنٹ پلانٹس کی تجویز شروع ہوئی تھی راجا وسیم ان ہز کالیگ اسٹوڈ اپ اینڈ سیڈ نو وہ پلانٹس بن گئے راجا وسیم ڈن اسٹاپ فائٹنگ ہی اسٹل ان دا سپریم کورٹ رائٹ اینڈ ہی از گاٹ ایم 
just about. Those companies haven't paid a cent yet. But I'll tell you one thing. When Raja Sahib started his, his civil society campaign against those cement plants, because the problem with the cement plants is that it's, it, we don't have anything with cement plants. They just take a lot of water. And they're situated in Chakwal because the limestone is close by. It's a major uh, resource for or the raw material for cement. And they're also very close to the motorway, which gives it transport access. So that's why they were located there. The problem with those plants is that they consume a huge amount of water and Chakwal is a dry area, it doesn't have water. And everyone knew if these cement plants start using water, the water table of the area would fall and it did. Uh, so much so that the famous Katas Raj temple, the right. tears of Shiva themselves dried up. We caused a cultural murder. Those cement plants, sorry, caused a cultural murder. And that's the lack of accountability I'm talking about. Those rich people, those three factories, and I can name who they are, right? They've made an immense amount of money in the last 20 years. They've not given a, a cent of it back to that community. And if you tell me when a school banana, I'll spit at it. That's hardly, hardly the, the, the type of interventions and contributions they could have made. But when Raja Sahib started this Mohim, shuru ki thi, he hired a, a, a corporate lawyer at the time who was interested in the environment. And he was in high court, mein haar ge, Supreme Court, mein thodi si jid -jid -jid ki. but he then became a judge. Yes. And in two years, Sayyid Mansur Ali Shah is going to be the Chief Justice of Pakistan. And that case is still in the Supreme Court. So I remain an optimist. We'll have it heard by Shahji uh, two years from now, Justice Shah, and we'll see what happens to those cement plants. Himmat ni harni. Activism is not about giving up. You can't give up. Activism, we talk about journaling. And now we're talking about journaling activism. Mein. Pakistan, mein jo ek I have generally observed, and I think that's unfortunate that we have made a day dead in the mosque. So perhaps that's why society is lagging a collective response. Uh, maybe we need to come together and help each other rather than you know compete in social sector. Could be. Although, uh, I, I remember again another mentor of mine, Roland D'Souza of Karachi, who used to work with a group called Shehri, Citizens for a Better Environment. He, 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 he was saying that he lived, he's a Christian in Karachi, in the neighborhood that he lived in, there were about six churches. <laughs> Same thing. Uh, and I knew, I knew what he was talking about. And ever since then, I've always worked with people. I've never set up my own shop. I've always found people to work with. And I think that's what you have to do. You have to, one of the things about the climate crisis, as I keep on telling people, you need to have empathy, you need to have the ability to work with other people. So activism should be about cooperation. And I know, you know, if you set up an NGO, you have to compete for funds and things like that. But within that as well, you can find friends and common themes and create alliances and raise your voice and become more and more powerful. Uh, so sir, my last question would be that activism ki apne baat ki, climate change ki humne baat ki hai. So as an individual, as a group of people who want to make something, who want to do something, unka starting point ke hoga and how does that journey go? With respect to climate change, I have a very specific answer because, as I said earlier, climate change is a combating climate change at, at some level is about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that you can only do by changing our energy usages and our transport usages, and also because methane is produced by agriculture, changing our, the way we eat. But not individually, just I can't change the transport sector myself. Right. I have to campaign so that we have public transport. I have to campaign so that our cities are designed in a more compact and sustainable way. Um, you know, I have to, I, I have a solar unit in my own house, but that doesn't mean that's a solution to greenhouse gases. Uh, we have to change the energy paradigm, not just of Pakistan, but of the world. These are systemic changes. They can't be counted individually. And to think, for example, you can count them individually is kind of it's st silly. Climate change has to be dealt with by society and by political activity. You need to have civil society and it has to be a political response because only political responses change the energy mix of a country. Only political responses bring in public transport in more sustainable cities. But despite that, I think you should also practice what you preach. You know, uh, you can't have a SU, diesel SUV and be a climate activist. So if you do want to th do things on, on an individual level, there are a number of things. Most people don't realize that perhaps two of the most uh, climate unfriendly things they can do on a day-to-day -day basis is drive a car and eat red meat, especially beef. So if you can, if it's not too dangerous for you, because I, I wouldn't recommend anyone use a cycle on Pakistan's city streets, it's too dangerous. But if you can, stop eating meat. Try that. If you're serious about it, tikke band karo. Because tikke bhi koile se bante na, that's another greenhouse gas producer. Try that for a bit. Those are something.
I think so that's a beautiful message to end our conversation with. Thank you so much for giving us time. It for was uh, lovely talking to you and a lot of learning to take away from this conversation. Thank you so Both much. Until next time, Khuda Hafiz.